É, boa noite a todos. Né? Hoje é o último. So, out, so, good evening again. And this is the third and last event of our um, series called Conversations with Beef Producers to share good practice between Brazilian and Australian farmers. So the idea is to look about what is happening in action. So we've got three different producers that they're going to talk about their experience, about putting things into practice in a business sense. So we've got here, Bellison, he heads up the Honkador group in Mato Grosso, in Brazil. They invest heavily in management, in technology and sustainable management. Their farm and their business is an example for good practices in Brazil. We also have Alison Larard. She's an Australian. She's been working for 20 years in as a professional in the ag beef arena. She's in, from Queensland. It's a very challenging climate with a lot of extremes for businesses to consider. She's also a Nuffield Scholar from 2018. Looking at um, how farmers can use planning tools to eventually get to successful succession opportunities. And third, you've got Vanessa. She's from the Morena Group. She's an administrator. She's also graduated from the Zalk University. And she manages the Moreno Group farm. To facilitate this panel, we've got the lovely Ingrid. She is a farmer in Goiás State in Brazil. She's also a technical director in OYA certifications that looks about that looks into promoting um, good practice through certification systems. She's also an Afield Scholar in the 2020 group. And her focus is on sustainability and how this is communicated in a meaningful way to consumers. So this is our great panel and a good evening to everyone. So hi everyone. Thanks Deborah for this introduction. I think tonight the profile that we've got of people here means that we're going to have a really excellent um, presentation and discussion because it's a practical view of sustainability from people who are hands-on in businesses. So to start, the idea is that we're going to have some short presentations from each of the people about what's happening in their businesses, what they consider to be best practice and how they're being implemented in within the business. And then we open it up for questions. So we invite you at any stage to send a question in on the chat. We're going to have a good amount of time to have some interactions and get the questions responded to. So to start with, I'm going to invite Pellison to share his presentation, share his screen, and let's go. Thanks very much for the uh, invitation. It's an honor to be here. To be able to learn a little bit and, and share something, what we've learned so far. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit and then I'll go to my presentation. So we're talking about livestock production, but our productive system is an integrated uh, cropping and, and cattle system. We, we do do quite a lot of soybean integrated with the uh, livestock. That, that's what we found to improve the results of the, the livestock system. So to 
introduce myself. My name is Pellison. I'm the, the head of the Ronkadu group. I can talk a little bit about our story, our results. And a little bit about our, our carbon study. So, so about, our, about our story. We didn't come from a specific consultancy plan. We, we came at it from, you know, one step at a time and do what we could. And each time we, we looked a little bit further and, and, and corrected our course and see where we were going. Yeah, improving our results each time. We were, we were gradually training ourselves to, to understand animal welfare and, and to understand the entire farm as a, a living organism. It needs to be in balance. We measure a lot. We follow a lot of indicators. Looking at the productive indicators and what are our gains. So we've put together an, uh, a balanced system that has regenerative agriculture and high, high technology livestock production. On our path, we've we faced a lot of challenges and, and learned a lot. We understand that there's a, a, a still a, a tripod in uh, sustainability, the economic, the sustainability, and the people, the social. So the initial nudge we had was was to increase our our economic indicators. We need to be more sustainable economically doesn't matter if we're, we have a pretty productive system if we're not making money. Same thing with our team. We need a team that, that believes in what they're doing. They, they identify as, as part of something greater. If you don't do that, you, you have a high turnover. Uh, you're always training and you, and you can't get the, the results you need. And, and finally, on the environmental sustainability, it's the base of everything. With, without that, we, we, we know where we, where we end up. Planet's going to warm up. We won't be able to produce food for, for humanity's needs. So we produce a lot. We, we take care of the people, the forests. And we realized that our, our system was, was doing, um, was improving the, the earth, the soil. So we're degrading the soil and then over with, as we've intensified this integrated system, we've realized we've been uh, making the soil more, more rich. It's full of worms, lots of organic matter below um, ground cover on, on the top of the soil, uh, keeping, uh, keeping moisture throughout the dry, the dry period. So within the property, we've got a number of, of productive systems. We've got perennial pastures with, uh, with supplementation, supplementary feeding, uh, fertilizing both organic and, and chemical. So we've got areas of livestock with, with greater or lesser areas of uh, intensity and, and a bunch of areas that are integrated system, which goes through soybean and then then we plant grass and then they put the cattle on. So this is the, the system that I'm gonna gonna focus a bit more on, the uh, soybean, grass, cattle. I'm just gonna go over it um, briefly and then each each slide you go into a, a lot, but it's not the, the case for today. So the 4P system aligning results with sustainability. So we'll talk a little bit about the farm. It's the farms in the state of Mato Grosso, close to Querencia. It's a farm of 152,000 hectares. Half the farm is in native forest. 
and half in productive area. In productive area, 50,000 hectares is the integrated livestock cropping. And the rest of the farm is, is permanent livestock, permanent pastures. So 10 years ago, we were in the productive system where the, the whole farm was, was in livestock, the um, cow calf to through to finishing. We, we turned over 10% of the, the farm each year, replanted the pastures. But this generated a, a downward spiral. Wasn't, wasn't good for anyone, wasn't sustainable. We didn't have economic results and wasn't environmentally sustainable. The, the KPIs, the livestock KPIs were, were poor. Each time they were going along the, through the cycle, they needed to, to renovate the pastures with shorter and shorter innovative intervals. So we started going up these steps in the, the process of intensification, everything that was within our reach. So, so we won't go through, through everything. One key point is the, the increase in the, the stocking rate, the grazing plan development. So we've got the, both the feedlot and the, the intensive supplementation in, in the pastures. Our, our cows are nilori, but all our, um, all our semen use is, is European breeds, both uh, Ruby and Galega, which is a, a Spanish breed, and, and Angus. So we started going into the cropping system, soybean principally. So that hit us down the path to, to start looking a lot more at the soil, the soil correction and, and investment in fertility. And principally the, uh, the concept of uh, you plant and then you reap. So if you, if, you, if you don't put in the inputs, you don't, you don't harvest what you need. And the main challenge is to, to integrate the two, two lot production systems. The biggest challenge is, is integrating the two systems, even if they are symbiotic. So we have an integrated budget. The, the entire team uh, is involved in the budget for both, both systems. We've got some, some of the team uh, operate in both, both systems. And this created a sense of, of belonging and ownership across the entire, entire system. So we ended up at the current system, which has got us to a, an ever increasing spiral. It's planting livestock the planet and people. The, the cycle of each time you plant and you, and you re, re what you sow. So increase the soil conservation, increases the nutrient cycle cycling and the nitrogen fixing, increases the organic matter, increases the soil uh, water available capacity. This leads to an increase in, in our uh, KPIs, our livestock KPIs and productivity, which all runs through to an increased economic results and a, a more sustainable city. So this is what we do. We plant the soybean, we harvest with the harvester, plant the, the grass and we harvest with animals. At this moment, is the end of the dry season. This would be September, a month ago, we take the animals out of these areas. We spray it out and we plant the soybean again. So in between the soybean plants, we have three layers of organic matter of, of soil cover. 
Our soil is always, always fresh. It doesn't see the sun. It's always covered by organic matter. A little bit before the harvest, we spread the grass seed via, via plant. And when we harvest, the, the pasture is already starting to germinate. So this is the, the driest period of the year. It's not raining and we've got this green mass of feed. We've got moisture in the soil because the soil is always covered. And in the middle of the dry period, everything around us is, is brown and dry. And when we get to the farm, we, we see this, this giant green seed. Why do we choose this system? If we, if we stay just within the, uh, the livestock system, this, this graph is the, the pasture growth rates throughout the year. October through to September, that's their, their productive year cycle. So this is how much grass grows each month. So you see the months that it rains, the quantity of pasture we can grow. In the dry months, it, it practically stops. If, if we didn't do anything to deal with this, we'd have to set our, our stocking rate at the, due to the, the low production time. So we've created an alternative. So this graph is a distribution of the, of the herd throughout the different systems throughout the year. So on the left is the, the number of animals, number of total head. 50, we, so we have 50,000 hectares. And we have 50,000 cows that we do the entire uh, productive cycle. So in the rainy season, we've got a lot of, lot of pasture. The cattle basically are just in the, the perennial pasture. Some of the animals in the... the supplemented uh, modules. As the pasture production starts to, to drop off in the perennial areas, we start putting the animals into the, the livestock crop uh, integrated areas. Through March, April, we've got a, a bunch of area that we've already harvested and we can start putting cattle into it. Throughout the, throughout the most critical period, we, we keep most of the animals on this, on this area, the integrated area. The orange line is the, the supplemented, the, the cattle that are supplemented while eating pasture. And the yellow is the, the feedlot. It's used more in the dry period to finish animals. Just to give you an idea of the, the stocking rates. Um, so one UA is a 450 kilo um, head. So a mature cow. So in the perennial pastures, we, we work between three and five uh, head a hectare. And in the, the dry period, the critical period, we use the entire farm with a, a lower stocking rate. To not overgraze while we, when the rain comes back. This lets us produce more, more food. So in 2009, we produced With almost 100% of the area at the time, we produced 4,150 and just 41 tonne of soybean. 2019, we produced 41 times more feed in the same area. 166,000 tonne of soybean. So that we, we're not stopped here. We're, we're continually improving and increasing that we expect the livestock uh, system to, to double in the next couple of years. So this is the uh, economic result per hectare with 3.6 times. So this is the number area of, 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 of forest. This is an indicator that makes the, the skin crawl of, of livestock producers. So this is the number of deaths um, by leopards, by jaguars. So 2009, we had 95 animals lost, 
and in 2018 we had 962 deaths uh, by leopard. We've got a, a certification. We're very, very proud to, to have this as part of our, our system, this, this work and preservation of an animal that's, that's endangered. So these are one of the, some of the automatic uh, automatic cameras that they've got set out throughout the forest. So these the jaguars are on their farm. So in a productive system, they do these trenches each year. They monitor what's going on underneath the ground. So we've got 2.8 meters of, of roots in the ground. So to put it all together, to guarantee the sustainability. The biological fixation of the nitrogen through the, the soybean which is available during the dry period. And then the root growth of the, of the grass de discompacts the soil um, and fixes the, the carbon at depth. We've got an increase in organic matter and the carbon in the soil. Increase in the soil permeability. We take the, the cattle out, we destock with at least two and a half ton of dry matter. So there's no compaction because of the, the, the cattle. This, this ground cover um, balances out the temperatures throughout the year. We've got the organic matter coming back in, nutrients through the, the feces and, and urine. When you're doing the, the proper grazing management, it stimulates the pasture to, to, to lower its, its roots down even further. We produce hay and silage to get through the, the, the transition period, which is our period of challenge, going from, going from the dry season into the start of the rainy season period. So we produce the hay for this. We've been we've been measuring it for for a long time, and it's it's we've come to the conclusion that that it's, that it's getting much better, increasing production, managing to take care of the forest and the and the people, and the economic economic growth results were were showing up. So the last thing we've done is we've we've started measuring the the carbon impact. So they went into the, the study. They did a partnership with an Abrapa. And with a, a financing institution. They've done 10, 10 samples throughout the farm to understand what was going on. And so within these samples, one was a, a remaining area that was the, the traditional agri livestock that they were that they were running, and one was in the forest. So the green line here was the degraded pastures in the traditional system. So there was 191 ton of carbon in the soil, and this is the the untouched native virgin forest, which had 467 ton, and all the all the intermediate stages went from the, the, the 191. They got the number of years that it's been intensified. Um, they think it's even going to get closer. So they've identified with the study. They weren't sure whether, whether the, the whether it's going to be positive or negative for fixing the carbon. They thought that the best result would be with the the soy grass cattle, and that was the, the actual result that they found, was the, 
the most positive system. So this is the the balance of the entire system. So within the farm gate. So we feel the responsibility to our to our children. What we're doing. We weren't really really sure what was going on in 2007, 2008. We were, we were at 46,000 ton of carbon equivalent. 2014, we were at, we sequestered 17,000 ton. And 17, 18, we sequestered 89,000 ton carbon equivalent. So for every kilo we produced, we sequestered one kilo of carbon. So you buy a, a kilo of food and you, you get to take a kilo of carbon with you. So what does this mean in, a, in an indicator that, that people can understand and feel? So what does that mean? So that Oncador, our Oncador farm and our Mantequera, which is their farm where I'm at today. So talk about Oncador. So we sequestered 89,830 tons of carbon. It's, it's the same output of 51,600, which would be the same all around the world. So this is the service we're, we're doing for to humanity. So we learn to learn. The system can always be, be improved, as, you know, just like ourselves. We we don't think we we know all the uh, we don't have all the answers. We, we need to keep learning always. That's why that's why we're here. Thanks very much for the, the invite. Hope I didn't go too long. Thanks for the information. Thanks for this great work that you're also doing um, for the betterment of people, for the planet, for this type of stuff. This um, symbiosis of the 4P is really interesting. And the way that we see that sustainability is so connected to technology. So when you tell us that you've gone from an extensive system to an intensive system to an integrated system. We can see how it's necessary to have good technology and tools, uh, soil management and other tools to connect people with science and understand how the farm works as an organism. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so to continue, now it's Alison's turn. We will ask you to please do your presentation. Just remembering for who's listening, we do have simultaneous translations. So down the bottom, you can choose to put in which language you want, English or Portuguese, to either listen to her translated or in original, and you can make questions. Very good. Thank you, Sally, and, and thanks everybody for uh, inviting me to speak today. Deborah, is it all right if my presentation goes up? Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've been warned that we Queenslanders speak too quickly and not clearly enough, so I shall endeavour to speak more clearly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm a little bit in awe of what I've just heard from Pallison because um, we come from a very different background here in North Queensland, uh, but I'll explain that as I go. So the next slide, please, Deborah. So my background, um, I'm an agricultural professional and agricultural economist by trade. Um, I sit on some boards and some committees and that sort of thing as well. Um, I've been very involved in working in family operations for the last 20 years, about um, 300 operations in uh, mainly in North Queensland. I've also been, uh, have, have had a long-term association with the home farm and we uh, have been 
Limousin cattle people, stud cattle people for the last 20 years. So that is my connection uh, back to um, the, uh, the real part of agriculture, the getting your hands dirty part of the job. Um, thank you, Deborah. Next slide. Uh, so in North Queensland, um, we have a climate very similar to some of those um, photos we've seen there from Pallison, but, um, but not um, as consistent a rainfall and our soil fertility is poorer. So we run fewer cattle on, um, on the area that we have in, in the north. Uh, we are predominantly family beef operations. Some larger operations, those businesses would run three or five or maybe 10,000 head of cattle. But many of us are also smaller operators like my family. You run 100, 200, 300 head of cattle, so smaller operations. Uh, and we turn off about a million head from, from these districts. Uh, next slide, thanks, Deborah. Um, for us, best practice um, has probably um, got a number of meanings in a way. Um, but what's important is that whatever it is that we think we're going to encourage family operations to do, that these ideas around best practice are practical, achievable, and most importantly, cost effective, because these are operations that work with tight margins, tight budgets. Thank you, Deborah. And I guess the, the adoption curve, which any of us who've worked in extension or with farmers, um, is, we're very familiar with. Um, we have many producers that sit in the middle of the curve, some not so advanced, so they struggle to get to best practice. And it's this group that we like to encourage forward um, because we have growing pressures um, in our operations and in our industry. Next slide, please, Deborah. The main issues we've got is where we are gradually catching up, I think we would say, and sustainability is, is really a focus now. Um, it has been a focus in an environmental sense for some period of time. Um, we've been very concerned with the quality of the water runoff onto the Great Barrier Reef for some period of time. Um, but it is, you know, we have to get the balance right between what's possible uh, in an environmental sense and what's possible economically. So we've been trying to get that balance there. There's now more pressure to do things from a social license perspective. So our consumers and our public are starting to push and encourage us to improve. And I think there's now a fantastic opportunity around what's happening generationally. So I've worked quite a, a lot with succession and look at um, encouraging families to transition through succession. And it's this generational change where the opportunity is now coming for us to improve rapidly. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I always try and look at these ideas um, by segmenting it, breaking it up uh, into you know, different areas of the business. So we always look at things from what we call a whole of business approach, the herd, the land, the money and the people in a business. Thanks, Deborah. So I guess this is now, I'm, I'm through my introduction and I'm into the nitty gritty of what I'd really like to talk about. Um, we have a lot of challenges um, around uh, the quality of the pasture that we have to feed in our northern production system. Um, there was a graph there that Pellison had that showed that peak period of rain in your system um, and where that pasture growth was and how it very much drops off August, September, October. That happens for us as well, very similar production system. Uh, and we have over time tried to find ways of filling that feed gap, but it is very difficult to do it uh, in a financially viable way. So over time, we've, we've tried ideas like matching stocking rate. So SR is stocking rate to carrying capacity and doing that better and trying to manage for the risk because um, the main issue that we have is that the rainfall is unreliable. Although we predominantly get rain in the summer in what we call a wet season, it's not uh, reliable in terms of how much we get and, and how well distributed that rainfall is. So we have to manage conservatively and that has proven to be difficult for us in our production systems in North Queensland. Um, one of the things we love to do as cattle producers, and I'm from a, a seed stock or a stud cattle background, is we love to look at our genetics. We love our cattle, but we've got to try and look 
harder at the nutrition and that side of the business. So we try and highlight that to run um, a cattle operation in North Queensland well, you need to really focus maybe 70% of your concern on the nutrition and maybe 30% is the genetics that makes you a success. So we're trying to, to get this idea, um, particularly amongst the older generation to focus more on, um, on the grass and the quality of the pasture. So we try and say we're not cattlemen or cattle people, we are grass managers to try and encourage that mindset. Because our production system is inherently um, uh, infertile, our soils are poor, we have to supplement. So we have to supplement both in the dry season um, with um, what we would say, we're trying to supplement protein. So we feed urea and those sorts of feedstuffs. We also try and supplement in the wet season with phosphorus. Our soils uh, lack a lot of phosphorus is, you know, what's typical about Australia. So to try and um, get these systems right, um, those systems then flow through to better outcomes for things like animal welfare, if we can do that well. Um, and obviously we also make more money if we do it better. One of the things we've tried to encourage to happen is, um, and you can see from this picture here, the cattle eating that green shrub is to try and encourage improved pastures. So the growing of legumes, um, that takes a different skill base from what many cattle producers have. If you grow up riding a horse and chasing cattle and working cattle, that's a different skill set from, um, from farming. And so it has been a, a process of trying to encourage these things to happen and support producers to do um, improved pasture programs and things. But that um, green stuff, you can see there, those cows are in, in medium sort of, you know, not great condition, but they're going all right for that time of year. You can see how poor the grass quality is around them, but you can also see the green um, there on the shrub. And that's what we call lachina, that shrub. And that's, um, over time becoming uh, more and more important in our production system in North Queensland. Uh, animal welfare is something I think my generation are becoming really passionate about um, uh, with what's gone on uh, in, in the sense with social media and the like. I think we, we feel that, um, you know, it's more and more important that we do a better job and that we could encourage people to come to our farms and our properties and show them what we do and, you know, and be proud of what we do. Uh, and so I think it's um, more and more important that we get these things correct. So the animal welfare standards are, are really lifting now. So we have um, more access to products that we can use um, in terms of um, antiseptic properties, antiseptic properties, um, these sorts of things that we can do to, um, I think just, you know, to do a better job um, more consistently. So it always comes back to cost in Australia, um, you know, as it does everywhere, but it's that things have to be done on such a scale and with, um, you know, with labour costing so much in, in our economy, it's really hard to get that balance right. And for whatever these improvements are to pay, um, you know, that is a really difficult balancing act for producers. Okay, next slide, please, Deborah. Uh, so one of the great challenges we have is in land condition in our northern production system. Um, and I, I don't really want to harp on, on it. It hasn't been great over time. Um, we've had a slipping in, um, in land uh, condition over time. And in part, we had a very long period of time where cattle uh, were, um, you know, the cattle prices weren't great, uh, cattle operations really struggled to make a living. And in that period of time, people push their properties harder. At the moment, cattle prices are high and interest rates are very cheap. So there is an opportunity to do things better. So we encourage people to seek out those opportunities. And one of the key um, ways of doing that is what we call wet season spelling. So we lock up um, maybe a quarter of the property each wet season uh, to give the perennial pasture a chance to grow out, set seed, and then get that cycle going where we have those better pasture species coming through. Um, I think, um, so I traveled in 2018 and, and came to Brazil and, and Africa and other um, rangelands uh, type systems, um, US, Canada. And I, I guess I came home 
although we work in our systems and sometimes we see, you know, the negative side of things and the challenges, I came home very optimistic that we have fantastic opportunities here because we have a system where we can be truly sustainable if we get that stocking rate better. Uh, and so I think that's really coming, you know, this is the really great opportunity for us now is that that stewardship culture has the opportunity to be encouraged and for that to be one way of looking at making improvements over time. Um, rather than just being producers, cattle producers, we're land stewards. So I think that mentality is, is changing now quite rapidly. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, the business side of things. So this is my pet part of um, the talk because being an agricultural economist, I, I like to get into the numbers and look at these sorts of things and the way they impact on the families and the businesses. So. Um, I'm um, very passionate about things running um, in a business sense rather than in just in a production sense. So those ideas around better collection of data um, and being able to understand our key drivers in our business better. This is the sort of um, this uh, stoplight styled um, visual representation is what I've got drawn here. Um, to show you the sorts of ideas that we encourage family uh, operators to look at um, to try and analyse their businesses. So better financial literacy is what we're talking about. If, we've, um, if we're family operators and we've come through um, our family businesses, perhaps we've been to college or university, agricultural college, but we're not necessarily that keen on looking at the numbers. We need to try and get independent advisors in to do a better job of that. So. Um, it's really encouraging people to become more familiar with what's going on in their business and then to understand what's driving um, the success of their business financially and creating the wealth. Because if we grow a business better, quicker, we then have a better chance of getting our succession, so a transition to the next generation, smoother uh, if we have the resources to do it well. So that's, um, although there's challenges with, with people not having the right skills, there's also now really great opportunities for um, people to do that better. Thanks, Deborah. And so the people side of things, um, which has been my, my pet thing for about four or five years now, and, and this was part of my Nuffield scholarship. So looking at how families and, and people live and work together, um, it's, a, a difficult thing, um, even if you have the best of relationships in families, it can be difficult if you're there working with, you know, father, brother, sisters, all these people together day in, day out. So it's about understanding yourself better and those around you and what motivates people in the, in the business. It's about having better people skills and human resource management skills to do those things well. It's about professionalising. So it's what we see in, in other sectors of the economy, some of those ideas coming back into farming businesses around roles and responsibilities and, and how we put the business structure together. And again, it's about having advisors to, to come in at the right time and guide people and help people do a better job. So I think this is something that's really changing. I think we've had a generation that succession was very tough for and these family operations were very tough, um, probably very patriarchal type businesses. You know, what dad said was what happened in the business, whereas now we, um, <laughs> Sal, <laughs> and now we are, um, uh, you know, moving into more of a professional style of, of business. I love watching the faces as I'm talking who, where I'm hitting the mark with the story. All right, uh, next, next slide, please, Deborah. <laughs> Uh, and um, this is my final slide, and I'm, I'm really hoping that I'm trying to hold a, a, a better English accent as I'm going and getting more excited with what I'm talking about. Uh, but for me, there's other challenges that really impact, and um, I think I've highlighted enough, you know, how variable our climate is. So climate change is such a big issue for us, particularly in the north, because we are the part of Australia that is, is really impacted by those big events, um, cyclones, floods, uh, drought when we cut, when we get it, we, we are really impacted by it because we don't get our wet season um, and we are, you know, so reliant on, on that part of the cycle. Um, and so, yeah, climate change has been an issue that's really been politicised in Australia. So it's, it's 
it's a hard one to talk to producers about it. But again, generational change is, um, is impacting there. And I think we're coming to terms better and, and moving along with how we're approaching things. Equally, the great fear is government policy around these things, as we call it red tape and environmental um, type um, implications around that. So we call it green tape. And it's how, um, how that's impacting on businesses uh, and the mindset of businesses is really important because um, you know, it, the risk there needs to be factored in and understood. Uh, and just very quickly also, marketing risk is a great um, issue and it, and it fits in a little bit with the social license issue in that our markets, um, we have this the part of our, our market that is live export based and, um, uh, and again, um, the people who are very concerned with animal welfare um, uh, have been driving at that issue for now about 10 years. So it's an area of our industry that we've worked very hard on. Um, I've been on one of those live export boats and, and you know, they are incredibly well run um, businesses and the animal welfare standards are so incredibly high and they do such a fantastic job. And we then, you know, export our cattle that way into, into areas of Asia. So for, for us, that part of the business is, is very, very important um, as are issues around accessing markets, given um, most of our marketing is centralised in Australia. And so you have to go quite long distances to move cattle to either market or to slaughter. So um, all these aspects, again, are animal welfare type issues. And so we're very mindful of all these things. So... Again, there's challenges there that we, we're overcoming. Um, and, you know, if we look at those sorts of issues positively, we, we can seek out our opportunities to, to do better and to move ahead. So thank you for the opportunity. Alison, thanks so much. Great information. Thanks for the presentation. I think that from my experience as a scholar and thinking about the experiences that I will get by seeing sustainability in a practical form, reachable and understanding how to get a positive cost benefit. This is really interesting. I had the opportunity in the beginning of the year to go to the Congress in Australia at the CSC. I get to see just a little bit more about Australian beef production and I could see how Brazilian beef has got a lot to learn still and we could put them into practice here in Brazil. There's also, it's very interesting, in sete. I don't know what an insect is. Uh, to have a look at our mindset and see that our animals are harvesters and that we are producing grass, shifting from being animal focused. So we'll move on now to invite Vanessa from the Moreno Group to share a little bit about the work that they've been doing. And then we're going to open up to questions. It's an honor to be here talking to people so, so experienced in the sector, just like Deba presented me at the start. I'm the, the process manager here at Morena Group. We're in the state of Mato Grosso. more specifically in the municipality of Campo Novo de Paracis. Gonna share with you guys my presentation, but I'll try and try and be short. People talked a lot about, about sustainability. I'm impressed a lot by the, where everyone's at. Can you guys see? Okay guys, so Morena Group is a real property, a producer of soybean, corn, uh, we've got eucalypt production, we've got a, a grain a grain storage, we've been operating for 30 years, it's a family family farm, I'm part of the family. 
and like Alice and said, it's it's not easy to be to be the day to day with the family, but it's but it's also really good. You've got a lot to add. Our, our livestock production's reasonably recent. We're, we've been cattle farmers for eight years. So we've got a lot to learn. You guys got a lot of experience. So our cattle system was started with a, a different purpose of uh, of intensity and technology. So our focus is on uh, growing out and finishing cattle, just 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 male cattle. We don't do cow, cow calf. We've got a lot of uh, agriculture like crops, specifically crops, uh, specifically soybean. So we've got a one cycle per year, 6,150 animals. This has been, been increasing throughout the years. And this year, the the market's really uncertain. So we, we had to relook at a few things this year because we don't we don't work with the, the cow calf. So we've, we've changed a few things for next year. The system that we work through is a, is a pasture system, permanent pastures, a semi-confinement system and a confinement a feedlot. Got the same system as, as the climate similar to, to Palacin. So we've got six months a year where we have, where it's rainy and six months where it's dry. So we work with the tools that we've got, the, the feedlot and the, the feeding through the transition period. And we work with the inter integrated system between cropping, forestry and pasture. In, in the dry season, we use these tools. And, and we've got the pruner pastures. We, we do the intensified throughout the rainy season. We use rotation and grazing. So we can utilize as much of, of this, the cheapest, most healthy feed that we have, which is the pasture. So in relation to our, pr our production, we try to use all the technology in our production system, this, these technologies from a, a pneumatic, a pneumatic branch. <laughs> Every, everything we've got that's possible to, to make it easier and that, that have benefits. Look at look at all the technologies that are available and some ones that aren't so so expensive. There's a lot of stuff that's available that's not very accessible in terms of, 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 the, of the price. Same with agriculture. There's a lot of technology available that the, the cost benefit isn't so so clear. There's some some technology packages in, in agriculture and cropping that there's so much technology there that you're not, not sure how to use it all. So we've got another system, which is really interesting, which is the ILPF, Integrated Livestock, Forestry and Cropping, which added a lot to our production system. We've got here in our, our cropping area, uh, we've been doing 15 years of direct, uh, direct Drilling. She said the area, the number of area. We've got a thousand hectares of cropping. We've got about 700 hectares, which is integrated cropping livestock. And we've, they've also got the cattle and forestry. So we've had soybean that's been more efficient, increased 400 kilos hectare. Our production is pretty good. We're about 4.9 ton average, and we managed to increase that with the integrated systems. Works really well in, in some of the marginal areas on the farm. Some of the areas that didn't have excellent productivity, we we're able to mitigate some of the, the impacts, like erosion with the forestry, increase the production of the soybean. We're able to absorb in the, in the dry season um, with a, a second crop, which is the, the, the second crop of pasture. 
So the system, integrated system only brings a lot of benefits. Looking at the animal welfare and, and uh, sanitary conditions and nutrition, there wasn't a, a vet in the system that was that, that took the front, but they, they always went after you know specialists and people who would help them come up with protocols to be to be more efficient in their cattle production system. Because we need to keep the animals healthy with low stress. We need to keep the animals uh, well fed. Because at the end of the day, crop farmer and the the livestock farm. They all depend on the people to make everything happen. So you need to make every everything or the relationships uh, humane. So their concern with within the entire system comes comes through this. So we've also headed down the, the path of having full traceability with our, our cattle. It's a process that, that involves a lot, a bit more detail and, and focus on that, you need to be quite involved. It comes to, to help close out the cycle. So you've got more control there. The, the consumer's got changes uh, perception on, on what's going on. Big focus on certifications and, a, and a, a vision on uh, sustainability. So talking about sustainability, here at Group in Morena, sustainability isn't a, isn't a problem, it's an opportunity, it's a very big one. So we've got an opportunity to produce and to preserve nature. He thinks that the Brazilian producer still has a lot of opportunity to be working, to be perceived as one of the biggest uh, conservationists because we work directly with nature. We need to we need to relearn to learn again that in the past we've had a lot of problems, particularly in these regions that are, are close to the in, in this region. We've seen a lot going on really well that's nearby. A lot of alternatives. I think different things that are happening that, that we can put put in practice on our farm. So the integrated production systems are the, the way forward. Dude, there's no way to go back. We need to produce more in the same area. We need to be more efficient and reduce the impact. So I've got a photo here of, of all the organic matter that comes out of our feedlot. We make turn it through compost and using our pastures. So what happens? The practical actions. So we've got reutilization of rainwater, uh, solar production. We've got recycling, but we need to, to change the mindset of people because it doesn't matter if I if I do these things if people don't understand why I'm doing that and what's the impact. So environmental education is the most important here in our city, Tangara do Serra. We've got a, a cooperative that does the recycling. So we take we take our recycling to this cooperative and, and the population in the, in the city doesn't have the environmental education. They do, do a lot of wrong things, stuff that shouldn't go in the right place. So we need to take this knowledge because technology is made, made information more democratic. People have access to this information now. So the education, environmental education, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? It's very important. So within our farm, we're trying to create a culture of, of reuse. Just give a simple example. An old tractor tire, maybe we'll throw away, but now it's a, a water trough. So I was going to I was going to buy a new water trough and it was going to increase the economic cycle, but it's not nearly necessary. We buy stuff, we throw things out. And integrated production systems, that's what it is. I'm using what my pasture gave me, reusing the fertility, and I plant a soybean 
and then next we do the opposite and then the soybean leaves organic matter for the pasture it's a cycle so we need to learn with nature that we have to keep reinventing and, and go forward talking about people which are an essential factor to be sustainable our dynamic we will look with a lot of care with our, our human resources so we need to understand that, that people need to be valued we've got um we've got 62 staff at the farm we're not a not a huge farm in the here we're in Mato Grosso they have big ones but we're going to do some small actions that we can do differently we've got a, a career plans transparent salaries a bunch of uh, um, social events with the, with the staff events to, to try and increase the innovation coming from the team Our salary plan and, and career growth uh, focuses on on development. Um, we've got the reality that there's low levels of, of, of schooling within our with our staff and in our rural areas, and we need to change this. We need when she sees people with a with a book in their hand and a smile on their face, it makes everyone happy. We've got about 10 people working with the cattle, and so they were learning about machinery. So the t-shirt they've got on is, is from the Sinar Institute, which, which is about vocational training in the, in the rural area. So we do a partnership with these guys. We do, every year we do a number of courses. So these guys can, can improve their, their knowledge and value the people. It's, it's them that, that makes it all happen. So I brought this this picture to talk about. So we've got the the livestock team and our nutrition technician. He comes 15, 15 days. So they're in the in the yards and they did a train training with a TV. And on the side there on the table, got got all the items, all the ingredients that the, the cattle So all the different categories of animals and they separate it out in portions. So even the guys that, that might be illiterate or have limited education are able to, to see and understand what's the importance of, of doing the, the feeding properly. What does each, each ingredient do? What is it? What's the importance? So we've got a very diversified team. We felt the need to do this. Uh, the cowboys know how to do the feeding or clean a trough. To make them understand that every every single job on the farm is important to the final result. So small things make a difference. Is there a cost benefit? Is it simple? And we change the mindset of the people that are involved. Need to talk a little bit about the inclusive management, transparency. So the photo on the top. So we need to take the management right out to the field. What is management? It's plan. Make it happen. Control it. How do we do this in the day to day? So on, the, on the flip charts and behind the guys. So that's the, the planning and the first one. What time are we going to? We're going to start in the morning to do the close out the, the feedlot for the year. What time are they going to start? When are they going to do? Who's going to do what? Who's going to do what? So we did a, a planning and we put it there. We followed it. We 
So everyone was was writing and, and putting the information up. So it was 150 animals. What was the time? What date was it done? What was the weight? And they had a plan to close it out in 10 days and they managed to hit it and everyone was involved. I'd like to talk about this example because it's a, a visual management and practical and everyone got involved. And this other, other photo down the bottom, the livestock team, they did a barbecue for the entire, the entire farm because we managed to, to close every, the confinement out in 10 days and we, we had a had a celebration with the entire team. And we can only do all of this work with the team, new, new ideas and share things if we've got a purpose. So like I said, our, our livestock's reasonably new, started with a, a different purpose. And I didn't manage it at the time that I'd be here telling you guys about it. But when we've got a, a purpose, it, it goes outside the farm gate. This idea of, of creating knowledge together, these photos that we got on the screen here, We've got a, a challenge at the farm, which is the Sentinel Challenge. Each team member that's, that's got a new idea, you can write down their idea. And the best idea wins, and there's a cash prize. And there's to see a bunch of uh, interesting ideas. So this guy down the bottom there with the, uh, with, the, with the hat on. He's one of, the, uh, one of the cowboys on the farm. He saw a... He saw some information on the TV around of the importance of bee production. And they they did eight eight beehives, and we put it in some of the planting areas and in the Sahara. And so we've this is a production of our, our honey there from the farm, and gave it all to the staff. Everyone was really happy. Key point is that. The staff member is there to take care of the cat. But a simple idea and creative idea, he started to take care of the world. And that's important. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to change. We need to disseminate good practice so that they people uh, feel it in their hearts and we make a, make a difference. That's what we're trying to do at the group of Moreno. The small work do small actions turn into to big impacts over time. This is the, what I want to pass to you guys. Once again, thanks very much and, and open for questions. Thank, thanks very much, Vanessa. It's fantastic. Super recognition. It's, as a manager, I've, I've been watching you for, for a bunch of time. You've got a a focus specifically on the on the human part of your project. You told me about the, the Sentinel product, project. It's an inspiration for me there at home. We try and replicate it. Because the work that you guys do, particularly in the social areas, is really incredible. I think it's, it's fundamental. It's, it's, it's a tendency. Is the the culture of, of reuse? I think we've got to we need to we need to put that in practice. When we think about nutrition and byproducts. What can we use? It's been that's there. That's available. That's been thrown away. Is there some value that we can we can find there for our system? Okay, we finished uh, the presentations. Want to invite everyone that's that's it's got some doubts or uh, questions to put it in the in the chat. 
So I'm, I'm going to make a start. I make a start. Can I make a question to Alison? Just hitting off from Vanessa's presentation, what they've been showing and what they're doing, innovations in their the production systems. Yeah, Alison, you, you work in succession and, and following a number of farms and families. How do you see this this process of succession linked to the process of, of sustainability? And what's this new generation doing that's that's taking on farms? How are they how are they dealing with this? Uh, you know, dealing with sustainability that's no longer a um, just something nice. It's a necessity. Okay, thanks, Ingrid. Yes, it's. Um, <laughs> fantastic to hear Vanessa speak in terms of the commitment to sustainability and just the way you're working it into your business model you know it's just a, a part of how you're doing business and that's how it should be it shouldn't be an add-on it should be you were talking a little bit back with um, your management and how you, you're moving your management through and being transparent with your um, with your employees as well I think building it in at every step along the way is is the secret um, to, to making that a part of how we do business. And I think, it, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit in awe of, of, you know, what you've all got going on over there because we're, you know, really just getting going on this journey um, with our, you know, our generational transitions that are going on here. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's great, great to hear you speak on it. Um, but that, that's my approach, I think, is that it's just part of doing business now. So when you put a, a business plan together, that sustainability or those sorts of things. Succession's a little bit the same. It's not just an add-on at the end of the business plan. It's part of how you do business. Thanks. We've got a comment here from Eloisa from Cuiabá. She said, congratulations, Vanessa. We believe in this step-by-step um, -step approach. So it's a question for Vanessa. Are you guys involved in some type of meat quality program certification? Okay, so because we have um, the traceability program, about 80% of our production is export quality. So it's got green certifications and lots of these types of classifications in the abattoirs. So these animals, they are um, Saudi Arabia, European um, standards. Well, we didn't actually participate in the initial program of the Embrapa's Neutral Carbon Program, but we're getting involved in with it now. We think that it's going to develop as a real option over time and we're involved in following it. There's no actual formula for sustainability. So a lot of people are working on what it means in their own work. So we're participating in the knowledge development. So yeah, so we're highly involved in the traceability aspect and in the carbon neutral space and looking at how we can contribute and what we can gain in this space. There's the RTRS program as well that we're linked with. Um, there's Cargo that have a program as well, but that might be more involved with crop at this stage. So along this line of thinking, I've just got a question for Pellison. How do you see, the, in terms of motivation around my research for the Nuffield project, I'm interested in knowing amongst all of the fantastic activities that you do, 
are you doing something specific for the to talk with the consumers that might be far away from the farm to show them the impact that you're having? Okay, first off, congratulations, Alison and Vanessa. Cool presentations. It's great to see passionate people um, we can identify in our interest in connecting people and taking things forward together. So, yeah, look, I'm also a family member. So this journey, this transition that we're mentioning that people want to stay involved and things also want to change and, and how we get there. So, yeah, so in terms of our social actions, um, it's they're really interesting and we could talk about them for a long time. So let me just um, tell you about one that's kind of connected a little bit with what Nessa was saying. It's called Choose Your Pathway. So when people come onto the farm, they, as a worker, they get a um, document that's got, like, all of the types of work that's available and then they have a look at it. We have over 400 staff. So they do a little rotation on a lot of different types of jobs. So it's the idea is that they the idea is that they get a little snippet of what is involved. And then we start to um, orient them specifically around some training to get them on their pathway of where they're going to focus their energies. A lot of people are born in farming worlds. And so there's like a guy that's always been involved in confinement and he started a job here in confinement and then he was like, hey, you know what, I want to go to the crop part. So is that possible? I don't actually know much about it. And now he's one of our kind of key coordinators in the crop section of the farm. And his wife, for example, um, has also got really involved now in the integration part and the monitoring um, and part of the farm. So the idea is that we just keep um, working with people to grow their knowledge so they can um, learn how to drive more than just drive trucks, they learn how to drive their, their professional lives. So now, Ingrid, I've actually forgotten your question. That's okay. I'm going to ask it for you again. So, yeah, it's cool because the idea is that we have a, a conversation. So also, Vanessa and Alison, if you want to add some comments or whatever it's it's uh, it's an open platform for discussion but yeah so my question is do you have something already in practice or do you see a way that you could show some of the great things that are happening within the farm to people who are in the cities or the consumers like all of these activities this huge list of great activities but Who's eating the food way out there? They don't actually perhaps know what's going on. So do you have something in practice or do you have some ideas on how we could show this to the consumer? This year, with the COVID, there's a, a whole bunch of opportunities digitally like Zoom. So, yeah, we've been involved in heaps of different conversations and different events, don't have to um, travel, which is great. You just can, you know, stop for an hour in the middle of your day and participate. So this has been something really positive for us to become involved in different events. But we have a um, like a communications person within the business and they've got relationships um within the marketing and communication sector. So they look for opportunities 
to talk about what we do. So there might be a report in Sao Paulo or um, in kind of key magazines or publications here in Brazil. They proactively look for opportunities. It could be general communication or science-based. Some of the more business-focused um, publications as well. Because we don't actually sell any product on the in the supermarket. It's we're just trying to talk about things at a society perception level. People, if they don't understand where things where food comes from, they don't have this kind of collective conscientiousness. Um, we just need to tell them how we look after the land, how we look after the animals, um, you know, that we've got 50% of the farmer's forest. We had um, a lightning strike here and we had like 500 people all from the farm going in and... Um, helping, trying to put out this fire for four days. Everything from bringing in um, drips to give to animals through to some of the practical driving machinery parts. So um, connecting with people and their purpose means that we can work as a great team. Um when we're all working together, the hierarchy of who's the boss and who's the worker gets broken down to just being as a team and working together. So it's really nice to share this knowledge within us and then be able to talk to others about it a bit as well. We do have some other actions. Um, we have to, we take it upon ourselves to tell the wider public about it, because someone has to do it. On our website, our Honkador website, it's interesting if anyone wants to have a little bit more of a look about what we do. It's www.fazendahonkador.com.br. They're kind of simple things that we do. We just kind of talk about each stage of production. So like a farmer could hop in there and have a look. Um, and he could see, like, okay, the different kind of stages that we do within the different sectors. Um, and we also share a bit about what we've learned um, along the production year. But we talk about it in a simple way. We think it's important to do what you can within your reach. Yep, I agree with you. It's... We don't know exactly always where this um, stigma comes from, but I believe and it motivates me a lot to try and understand and how we can better tell our story to others about what we're doing. We also need to recognise um, that you know, there's dentists, there's laws, lawyers, there's everybody that are good and bad within different professional markets. So farming is a bit like that as well. But we've got to talk about, um, talk to others about what exists in our ag world. Sh show this to other people. Vanessa, I'm just going to add a little bit. Um, there's a great group here in Mato Grosso called Agro de Gardas, Connected Agri People. We are working together um, and trying to find a way to be really assertive of that, our, the way that we're communicating. So we're not just talking to ourselves. We need to... We're, we've always been good at producing, but now we need to... <laughs> produce a good image. So what this group is doing about that is we're trying to communicate assertively about cool things that people are doing, about improvements that have also been happening. We're promoting field days. We're doing things on um, 
social media, we're opening farms so people like schools and city people can come and visit farms and get a hands-on idea of what's happening. So we've got one project called um, the Farm Academy, which offers people a chance to look professionally what is involved in farming. They could maybe even choose to take a career out of it. You said this really well, Ingrid. There's good and bad doctors around the place. So we, we can't um, just shut the door on this conversation. We have to understand the people who don't understand what we do and talk to them in a way that it works for them. So Agriligadas has an inclusive kind of culture and we're thinking about how we can use that to communicate well and connect with and change with a wider conversation of the public. I, I just add to that by saying, I think there's a real opportunity for all of us to look for the where we can target wider audiences. So in Australia at the moment, podcasts are the thing. So, you know, we spend so much time driving our cars. It's so long to get from A to B. This is where we spend time now. And so there's this opportunity for not just to be engaged with our agri-media, but that wider media. So most of us have a story, you know, so it's not just the logic of what we do. It's not just the science or the economics. It's what you call a narrative. It's the story. So the story about the honey had been, you know, produced and, and for that to go back to, you know, the local people, that's a story that to me city people would be interested in, you know, people disconnected from agriculture. Those kinds of human interest stories, I think that's what we've got to be doing better at. So for mine, you know, it's the story of, you know, um, woman, young kids working with dad on the farm. The fact that I've done 20 years of being, you know, in people's books, doing the work and doing this sort of thing, that's not of interest really to other people. It's the human side of what we all do that's really important. So to find ways to promote that and connect us all back to our city cousins is I think where the real opportunity is. And, you know, and we all have, you know, these sorts of devices to help as part of that. And Australia, fair enough, we are much smaller and we're probably all one or two degrees of separation from our city cousins, but I still think there's that opportunity to, you know, with really good profiles, Instagram, whatever we've got, make sure, you know, those things are your brand. So make sure it comes back quite quickly so that people can see you've got a really consistent story. So when your name pops up somewhere, away they go and we connect. And I think that's what um, organisations like Nuffield do very, really well, is you start to understand the power of the collective, of, of how that can work and that messaging. So I think, to me, that's really important. Anyway, thanks, Ingrid. Deborah, you had a, a comment? I've got a question for the three of them. It's a, she's talking about how to to a path. It's, it's a film that's that's going with time, that's changing through time, but throughout this path. What were the, the biggest challenges? throughout the process. What was, what got in your way? What was, got in the way throughout this path? I'm sorry, I struggled with that one as well. Would you like to, to start, Vanessa? Vanessa, who wants to start first? I can talk. This is Pellerson. I think that a challenge, the main challenge that, we, that we've got 
And in relation to everything we've, we've talked about by Alison and Vanessa talked about this, this question of the, the generations of the, of, of the farm and the, the culture that he has. You know, his cattle are his cattle. It's very different. If, if Vanessa said they went from went from cropping through to the farming, must have seen what's a, a completely different culture in the livestock sector. So I think that the identification of the of main indicators, KPIs, you know, this question about the carbon, what do we what do we hear about that? Oh, the bull, he, he spits out something. It's, it's really scary. How do we not look at the numbers and we, we look at everything? How, how do how do we how do we account for for what he emits, but we don't account for what with the input of carbon into the system? It's it's something that he he discusses with the the scientists constantly. The study that we did. He think leaves everything a, a lot more clear. When you start talking about numbers. He he didn't do them, but he, when he, when he started the study, he didn't know whether it was going to be good or bad. He thought maybe we'd be in a meta, and then we weren't. We're we're sequestering. He was ready to to reduce the size of the herd. He thought maybe we're going to have to we're going to have to to slot, to stop because we're in a meta. But when we looked at the entire system, he worked with the with the scientists. He got right into the data and the numbers because we need the, these things in our hands. So when people come, I can I can show, I can understand, I can. You know, so people come and they they know they can show what he knows what he's talking about. But he's got an, obviously a lot lot more to learn and double his knowledge, but you know, it's not a problem. But the sustainability indicators become something ethereal and unsure of the sustainable, but they're, they're really simple things if you look at it closely. If you take someone out to the pasture and you've got to tell whether it's you know, the, the cattle are happy or not, whether it looks good. People better understand if, you, if your soil is good, if it's covered with organic matter, whether it's got moisture. We need to turn the, turn the corner on this. Sustainability isn't separated from everything else. I think the, the carbon indicator it should be the should be the best indicator that we've got in the entire system if we've got a new, a balanced system because you've got legume and yeah you've got animal that's putting life into the system here a lot you know each a bunch of different stuff that we get we are asked about and society asking us us about you know glyphosate as an, an example and the agrotoxic, you know, the chemicals that we, we use. And he thinks that, you know, with these, what he hears, does he, does he think, is there actually something in this? Is there, is there something that's going, going on? Am I doing something bad? So we do direct, direct drilling and we, we apply the minimum. You know, who, who wants to... to to use a whole lot of uh, chemicals, it's expensive. Well, you know, where does this thing come from that, that the society think that farmers want to use a whole lot of toxic chemicals all around the place? They do three types of crops, the, the soybean crop. So do a little bit of organic soybean to, to just keep, keep up to date. So they do a transgenic soybean. 
which you know in the reality there's there's less chemicals used in the the transgenic soybean so you know, what does that mean of, of what's actually used so we've, we've started using uh, biological controls as well we have to do everything you know within within the balance to reduce the amount of of, of chemicals and inputs that we use but there's always this this ghost. Is there is there reality something some glyphosate left behind a residual? So they they test it, just check it out. But the reality is there's there's nothing. There's no residual. You know, just there's some number that zero point zero 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 something. You know, so like a one hundredth of of what uh, Europe's limits are, and, and most of the time it comes back as complete zero. They're looking for a soybean that has zero residual. So we're doing it. We're doing a doing something this year to try and to make sure we uh, we've got zero residuals. This is the sort of thing that, that, that that's changed within the producers, and we, we need to do even more. We need to we need to talk and each time order the different producers so we've got a you know we talk about oh we've got a very very large farm we can we can we can and so then when we we could talk about the smaller farm minus it's 3300 hectares you know it's the same thing the numbers are the same this <laughs> after i've gone around the circle see We have to be able to have the indicators to measure and to be able to put on the table and discuss, you know, openly. It's all here is the information. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. I mean, tell me why I'm wrong. Why, why do you think it's not good? Why do you think there's this glyphosate in my soybean? Why do you think that we're, we're doing, you know, doing something bad against animals. Let's go have a look. Let's go have a look. They're all lying down. They're happy to chewing the cut. So all our animal, uh, you know, hits the European quota, the, all the European rules. It's all here. It goes to another market because it's worth more, but it, it meets all the requirements. Yeah, I think that's exactly, you know, I agree with you 100% to have the data on our hand. And principally, when we're talking about, you know, independent scale, I'm here in a region in Goiás, a medium-sized producer, and now a region where we're mainly smaller, medium producers, smaller than Mato Grosso. Necessity doesn't matter, you know, whether we're 5,000 5, hectares, 50,000 hectares, you can manage the system, uh, connected system the need to have your, your indicators in, in hand. I think it's fundamental. We've, we've got a, a question here in the, in the chat. I think we're already now 40. It goes quickly when, we're, when it's good. Question from Luis Cesar. Vanessa, you could reply to us. I would like to know, in front of some amazing indicators, where do you get your your inspiration to improve your your work? That's already already amazing. I think everyone could answer that because they're doing work. But tell us about your inspiration. Well, we 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 ask ourselves the same thing every day. Because here at Moreira, we. We we look for 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 ideas even outside of the agro agribusiness. We look at industry and commerce. We need to think outside the box. Farms need to be seen as business, not just as 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 rural. They're, they're, they're sometimes big big business. So talking about the the challenge from from Deborah. So five years ago we talked we went to a course that was a management course. The organizational culture is just going to change 
after five years. He said, that, no, that's, that's a long time. Five years is a long time to do something. He said, no, nah, it takes five years. That's, that's what it is. So we started to change things within their property. Now in the fourth year, almost in the fifth. And a lot of stuff has started to, to show through the, the results of all the stuff. We've, we've got to have the, the patience. Because when you start to change an operational process, it's really quick. So now I'll plant over there, I'll plant over here. Now I'm going to use this machine, I'll buy the other one. You don't change the, the way people think from one day to the other. People people come with a, something, you know, a bunch of baggage, some cultural stuff from back. So this is how we change, change certain things. I think it's really cool how we, we look at sustainability and production with these this vision. As I saw recently in an in a interesting film that was Leo from Sustainability from McDonald's that posted it and I watched it. A Life on Our Planet. One phrase that you thought was really interesting. No, no species can, can prosper if you don't have other species prospering around you. So the entire ecosystem has to go forward. So we need to have a, a keen look at what's going on around us. I want to thank Aqualar, a coalition for Australia and Latin relationship for, for sponsoring this event, making it possible all the members of NAFIO that made it happen. So thanks to Sally and Jessica that's translating. Listen, for here, <laughs> Roger that's helping as well. <laughs> Sorry for getting back. Alison for, for being here, and sharing your, your information and, and experience. NAFIO is about that. For those that, that are, don't know much about Nafil, it's we ask you to, to, to be part of it. It's about people. It's about sharing experiences and developing together. I wanted to pass the word over to, to Deborah for your final comments. I just want to thank for, to be part of this. Thanks to Ingrid for the partnership. This panel. We had another two, uh, two presentations. They're available on the Nafio channel. This one will be on available on YouTube later. Anybody that wants to share it later, there'll be options in Portuguese and English. I want to congratulate you guys for the initiative. It's not easy work, but it's necessary. And we know that we'll keep reaping the rewards. To change this, this image that society has of, of what we do. And what's necessary is to, to spread the word. A little bit about the uh, the lack of knowledge on on, on agriculture and, and ends to ends up in, in in wrong perceptions. And anything we can do to help? Any, anything we can do, we'll do it. We'll do it together, and and we'll get get more stronger together. So that's it, guys. I want to thank everyone. Good night, everyone. The webinar's recorded and will be available on the YouTube of the Nuffield channel. Anyone that wants to share it later, it's going to be there. Thanks very much, guys. Cheers.